Hello, I'm Hazm Seeker. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, the Trump doctrine, tariffs first, negotiate second. Who benefits as the global economy slows? As Mexico steps up security on its border with Guatemala, we find out how climate change is forcing many to seek opportunities abroad. And peak car, slumping vehicle sales and the rise of Uber. What was behind Fiat's attempt to merge with Renault? So the direct impact of the US-China trade war has yet to materialize. The global economic slowdown started long before the opening shots were fired in this battle. Central banks are getting ready to cut interest rates if they haven't already started to support growth. All this to mitigate the fallout from Trump's doctrine of tariffs first, negotiate later. For a transactional president seeking a second term, unleashing tariffs is the solution to all foreign policy issues. Trade talks with China have broken down. Huawei can't buy U.S. goods. And Donald Trump has threatened tariffs on imported cars from Europe and Japan. The sanctions against Cuba, Iran and Venezuela have yet to yield any benefits. And in his latest move, he's decided Mexico needs to do more to stop immigration. If it doesn't, that's tariffs for Mexico as well. But the move has rattled global markets. The problem for Trump is he keeps saying other countries are paying the tariffs. They're not. U.S. importers are. And at some point, consumers will pick up the tab. Now, Mexico is the United States' biggest trading partner, exporting $347 billion to the United States in 2018. A 25% tariff would cost about $86 billion a year. With many U.S. and international car makers located south of the U.S. border, the auto industry will be the hardest hit. Deutsche Bank estimates vehicle prices could rise on average $1,300 if tariffs hit 25%. It would also add $28 billion a year to the cost of completed vehicles and parts. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the value of cars, buses, and trucks imported from Mexico totaled $68 billion in 2018. While Trump wants automakers to move back to the U.S., which is highly unlikely, this could have a devastating impact in Mexico, where 839,571 people are employed in the car industry. Now, an unintended consequence could be more migrants crossing the border as unemployment rises in Mexico. And what does it mean for jobs in the United States? Well, according to the economic consultancy Perryman Group, more than 400,000 jobs could be lost if the U.S. imposes the 5% levy. The net loss to the economy could be $41 billion. And the state that's most dependent on Mexico is Texas. It stands to lose more than 100,000 jobs and $7 billion in income. Now, if Trump's trade war with China is anything to go by, the damage to the economy has already been done. The president has signed a $16 billion bailout for farmers. We have two reports for you this week. In a few moments, John Hendren reports from Colfax, Illinois, deep in Trump country, to find out whether the president still has the support of farmers. But first, as Mexico steps up security to stop the flow of immigrants on its southern border with Guatemala, David Mercer went to Paraje Leon to look at how climate change is forcing people to look for opportunities in the United States. On this dusty hillside in Guatemala's western highlands, Francisco Leon Soc prepares a field for planting. A decade ago, he could grow enough corn to feed his family for most of the year, but these days, his harvests are getting smaller and smaller. Francisco says climate change is to blame. The weather shouldn't be like this. It used to rain in the middle of April, but now the rain doesn't arrive until the end of May or the beginning of June. We always wait until it's rained before we plant our corn. If it doesn't rain, we don't plant because the seeds won't grow. Average daytime temperatures in Guatemala have risen over the past decade, while crop damaging frosts are more common. And when it does rain, it often pours for days, washing the topsoil away. Guatemala already has the highest rate of child malnutrition in the Western Hemisphere. And in the Western Highlands, indigenous subsistence farmers make up half the population. When crops here fail, people leave. 
Julio Leon Kak wants to follow his uncles to the United States. The 18-year-old says that there's no future for young people in his village. The only people he sees getting ahead have left to work abroad and send money back. I want to make something out of my life, to be able to follow my dreams. I want to get a good education, find a job and help my family. Here it's a struggle to save even a tiny bit of money. As Guatemala's dry corridor continues to expand, more farming families are set to struggle. Guatemala is one of the 10 countries in the world most impacted by climate change. And while people leave the country for many different reasons, at the root you will often find climate change. That makes adapting to and mitigating the changing weather patterns a priority. Marcos Leon Chahak knows how far a little help can go. He built this drip irrigation system as part of a U.S.-funded project focused on crop diversification, water and soil conservation, and reforestation. The goal, to create a stable income from agriculture. We have the desire and the will. What we don't have is the capital. But the assistance from U.S. aid and other countries helps drive us forward. Not just me, but many farmers. We're able to help our families and we're able to better care for the environment. President Donald Trump has threatened to cut aid to Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras for failing to stop illegal migration. For families like Francisco's, that could make the decision on whether or not to migrate to the United States that much easier. David Mercer for Counting the Cost, Paraje Leon, Guatemala. As the U.S. administration plows ahead in its trade war with China, American farmers say they're getting crushed between the world's two largest economies. We grew a record soybean crop, record corn crop, and then you take the fact that our largest buyer just disappeared. You know, we created a huge ending stockpile that is, is, it's going to take years uh, to eat through it, not to mention we tripled what we normally carry. China's retaliatory tariffs on corn, soybeans and pork have hit their mark. American farmers deep in Trump country across the Midwest are suffering. This has probably been one of the toughest years that I've experienced in my 40 plus years of farming. Our bankers are starting to get nervous. Next year is going to be um, a tough time that some farmers are not going to get their operating loans. They're not going to pay off their operating loans from this year and they're not going to be able to get credit to put a crop out next year. For the second straight year, President Trump signed a bailout for American farmers, this time $16 billion worth. But that won't bring back lost markets. Buyers who've moved on to other sellers. Their silos are full of surplus crops. That oversupply has tanked prices for corn and soybeans. Farm income levels are half what they were five years ago. Across the Midwest, corn and soybean farmers are filing for bankruptcy in numbers not seen for more than a decade and losing their patience. I'd like to see that light at the end of the tunnel and know when things are going to turn around and get better. So your, your patience is wearing a little thin. Just a little, yeah. This year, farmers are dealing with high tariffs, low prices, and now historic rains that have left their fields flooded. But while China's tariffs are striking their intended targets, they have not achieved their goal of turning the farmers who are among President Trump's strongest supporters against the president. Is it fair to say that uh, farmers still by and large support President Trump? I think that's fair. We believe that the president's doing the right thing. To live on a farm, as an old agrarian saying has it, is to be schooled in patience. For now, those laboring behind America's plows seem willing to wait a little longer. Now, the EU has the threat of tariffs hanging over it, and it is under pressure to block China's Huawei. So who better to turn to for his thoughts on this than Luigi Gambardella? He is the president of the business lobby, China EU. Thanks for being with us. Now, as someone who has the ear of uh, business leaders in both China and the European Union, what do you make of Trump's strategy of tariffs first, negotiate second? I think uh, there are two, two major risks. Uh, today. The first is the uncertainty that is creating. I always say uncertainty can kill an elephant. Uncertainty is very bad for business. And second uh, uh, aspect that I would like to underline is uh, the fact that uh, um, it always be good to keep a difference between when is business and when is politics. And when we, there is a risk 
that we mix up business and politics in a grey area, this is something that uh, uh, can be very dangerous because then there is a less, uh, uh, again, a certainty. Uh, there are two important things for Europe. Uh, first of all, to defend our, the multilateralism. We believe in multilateralism. And second, we believe in global standards, in global regulation. And for us, uh, uh, for European business, these are uh, two very important points um, uh, that should be defended. Another big issue uh, for the US, of course, is the Chinese tech giant uh, Huawei. Do you think European companies can benefit from Huawei's ban? Uh, let's go beyond Huawei. Huawei. Huawei is just only the tip of the iceberg. I want just to mention two numbers uh, which have been recently published. Uh, research and development investment in China reached 1.76 trillion RMB. It's the second spending in the world. The number of patents reached in China are 1.382 million patents, ranking number one in the world. What I want to say that I think uh, that uh, this uh, debate uh, uh, is beyond one single company. Uh, China, uh, six months ago, a few months ago, already started the research for 6G. So uh, uh, we are in front of us uh, 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 a big challenge and, and we have to understand what matters today is less trade and more technology. And here I say, I like to say that the new land is technology. So what can the EU and China do uh, collectively? Could they, could they use an alternative currency to the dollar to, to trade, for example, to, to get around uh, the, the sanctions and the tariffs? No, I think that uh, from my point of view, uh, first of all, you know that uh, the, the economy and the industrial system of Europe and China are very comple complementary. What is important today for Europe, apart to keep uh, uh, a leadership in the, in, the, in the global regulation, which we know for many sectors is very important, I think what we should do is basically two things, is accelerate the uh, internal market. We need a real European internal market because if we create uh, uh, and we do, we do uh, progress in uh, have a real internal market, this will be very important for Europe. At the same time, uh, also increase the investment on, on, on research and development. How, in your view, then, is, is trade uh, changing? Um, and and how, how, how is this change um, affecting uh, China, the US, and Europe? We should consider trade uh, as evolving. Uh, today, uh, goods are less important than services. And we know that the value added is, a foc is mainly in the services, it's not anymore in the goods. And obviously, uh, here, there is a risk because if country like US and other industrialized country, they uh, try to uh, do everything in their own country, what will happen to the emerging country? What other country outside Europe and, 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 and US will do? Uh, and I think it's important. On the other hand, as I said, uh, uh, the reality is that the services are, are, are more and more important. And uh, uh, the, new, the new game is uh, more linked to the technology, the digital transformation, the capacity to invest in, uh, in research. Uh, and because technology is also changing the trade, is also changing entirely the system of logistic, of transportation, and uh, of industrial production. Good to speak with you, Luigi Gambardella. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. Now, in the end, it wasn't to be. Fiat Chrysler's ambitious $35 billion plan to merge with France's Renault. The combination would have created the third biggest automaker, but the cost in jobs was probably too much for politicians to stomach. 
We'll get more in a moment with our guest as the car industry goes through a difficult transformation. Consumers are changing their buying habits and governments are clamping down on emissions. But first, Osama bin Javed reports from Turin, the heart of Italy's motor valley and the home to Fiat. Almost every car enthusiast in Italy has a connection to Fabrica Italiana Automobili Torino, or Fiat. The car manufacturer is now Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, but still one of the biggest employers in Turin, Italy's automotive hub. Torino al 36% di disoccupazione giovanile. Hugo Bolognesi rallies former colleagues to fight for their rights and thousands of other workers in the diminishing auto industry here. Fiat Chrysler has temporarily laid off more than half its workforce at this plant for what it calls modernization. They work very little and this is very serious. It is clearly the result of no longer having the Italian automotive industry. Rather, it's become a multinational company. Fiat representatives have met unions and say more than $5 billion will be invested over three years and there will be a return to full employment. This factory was inaugurated in 1939. It has seen the height of Fiat's production. But since then, the company's headquarters have moved to the Netherlands. Its financial headquarters are now in London and the bulk of Fiat Chrysler's production is done in Detroit. Once home to tens of thousands of workers, Turin's a shadow of its former production of 6,000 cars a day. Besides jobs, the once booming car industry changed Italian lifestyles. It made them modern and mobile. But that's all in the past. It's very difficult to imagine a future for the Italian automotive industry because in 20 years, the number of workers and the number of cars manufactured has reduced tremendously. Italy's so-called motor rally still produces fewer but bigger price tag cars, such as Maserati, Alfa Romeo, Ferrari and Lamborghini. And some entrepreneurs are using it despite Italy's skyrocketing public debt and recession fears. This family-owned business, which used to make seat belts for passenger cars in bulk, is now a niche manufacturer of seats, seat belts and motorsport products. Giorgio Marciai founded the company in the 1970s, but he sees a future only if the government pays attention to Italy's slowing industrial production. We just need the government to realize the, the, the big challenge that the country and the industry, we have nearly 11% unemployment. Marco Rizzone is part of the coalition government's Commission for Economic Development. We are lowering taxes, we are lowering bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is the, the uh, worst tax we have in Italy. One year is uh, not sufficient to change uh, uh, an economy of a country. Because if you uh, have a, a job problem, an employment problem, you cannot solve it in one year. The real test for Europe's second producer will be to endure this economic pressure and allow an industrial rebound. Well, joining me now from Rome is Felipe Munoz, Global Automotive Analyst at Jato Dynamics. Thanks very much for being with us. So uh, what went wrong in the end? Why did this merger not go ahead? Well, I, first of all, I think uh, the story hasn't finished yet because uh, neither FCA nor uh, Renault, they have a plan B. So maybe the withdrawal uh, is part of the game. I mean, we have to remember that uh, both groups together wouldn't only become the third largest car maker, but they would become the, the world's largest SUV maker with almost 2.9 million units sold last year, according to our data. So it means they would become the leader in the only driver of growth uh, that is remaining in Europe, USA and China. Uh, however, I think uh, the strong presence of the government uh, had, a, had a big thing to do with this, uh, with this end. I mean, especially in Southern Europe, the governments instead of enabling, enabling a business, they are making things more difficult to these kinds of operations. Finally, I think uh, Renault might be using this merger proposal to send a message to Nissan, who has been its partner for 20 years and sh which should be its natural partner to merge with. Well, you talk there about the government involvement, but um, however way you, you look at this, the political cost would have been uh, too great, wouldn't it? Jobs, jobs would have to go because 
we're producing too many cars, aren't we? Well, yes. I mean, uh, I think, however, that in, in any in any uh, merger, the, the the main reason of any merger is to save co save money and reduce costs. In the case of FCA and, and Renault, uh, uh, the Italian American maker would benefit from Renault's know-how making uh, electric vehicles, and the French side would benefit from the strong presence of FCA in, in, in North America. Uh, the, the, the costs related to these, of course, there are costs, but I think there are more ben benefits than disadvantages. And uh, at the end, it's, it's, it's up to them to decide whether to go, or go on or not. I, I mean, uh, when, we, when we see all of these and when you see that the growth is, is slowing down, uh, actually, in the first quarter of this year, uh, uh, vehicle sales fell by 11% in China and 4% in, in the US and Europe. You need to find other solutions to keep the profits. And the best way is by doing these kinds of operations. So how are habits changing then? I mean, why, why are people uh, putting off buying cars? Well, many things are involved. I mean, as cities get more crowded and public transportation is improving, many people are just getting rid of their cars or are just not using them because a car is becoming more a problem than a solution in cities like Rome, like New York. And so people are not buying cars anymore. This is especially the trend among young people. And, uh, and also we must uh, consider that communication and uh, working habits are changing. So people are working from home, so they don't need to move, to move uh, around as much. So has the industry been too slow to respond to these changes, do you think? Yes, absolutely. The industry, the car industry, is extremely slow when taking decisions because it's, uh, it's very expensive, it's, uh, it's a huge industry, and the most important because it's vital in many economies. So every time a big thing like this happens, local authorities want to get involved and uh, this makes things more difficult. As I said before, politics and business are not, are, are not always a good marriage. So the industry is moving very slow. I, just to give you an example, in the, in the electric vehicle market, consum it seems that consumers are moving faster than automakers. I mean, I mean, you find very long waiting lists for electric cars. The offer is still very limited. So many consumers are just not, they don't want to wait and they move to other kind of solutions. Automakers are also spending tens of billion dollars uh, on electric cars. That too is going to lead to job losses as well, isn't it? What do you think is going to happen there? I mean, I think electrification is not really the threat. I mean, I mean they are, uh, this, uh, according to our data, these, the sales of uh, electric cars last year totaled 2 million units which is nothing compared to the almost 95 million vehicles sold globally. But it's a lot when you compare the sales in five years ago, when, when the industry sold 175,000 units. So I don't think the threat is the electrification, but what I think the big challenge for the industry is the way how uh, consumers are going to use and own their cars. If the ownership uh, changes, that's going to mean uh, fewer cars in the streets, and that's going to be a big challenge for companies running big plants. All right, Felipe Munoz, thanks for being with us. Thank you. And that is our show for this week. Remember, you can get in touch with us by tweeting me at HazimSeeker, and do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. And as always, there's lots more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. So that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Hazem Seeker from the whole team here. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.